Do you know what she hit her head on? Was it the floor or? No, no, it just, it just fell. And then she just she wasn't responsive after that. I didn't know what the hell to do. So, so what, were, what did you do next? And just try, I, like, I just tried to wake her. I tried to like snap her out of it. And it just, it just kept getting worse. Just, she just wasn't responding. She, had, she made weird breathing sounds. And I'm thinking, oh, sh- this is Stephen Williams, the last person who saw Trisha Todd, who worked as a hospice nurse and disappeared on April 26, 2016. Despite extensive searches, she couldn't be found for nearly a month. Suspicion fell on Stephen, who finally claimed to have found Trisha dead. In fear of being framed, he said he drove her to a random location and left her there. If you happen to be a fan of the show Brooklyn Nine-Nine, then you must remember the smart cop, dumb cop angle which is a take on our traditional good cop, bad cop theme. But in today's case, you will witness some fresh and unique dynamics of good cop, genius cop. Once he was brought in, several interrogations happened, and Steven kept on changing his story. Before we go through the main interrogation footage where the cops finally managed to get Steven talking, it's important for you to know what had really transpired in this case. Steven said that he found Trisha unconscious in his Airbnb room. Stephen freaked out and thought Trisha was trying to frame him. He panicked, took Trisha in her car, and kept on driving before stopping at a completely random location where he laid Trisha's body. The reality was very different. Stephen had murdered Trisha. He had first tried to strangle her, and when he lost consciousness, he waited to get her email password and other information from her once she woke up. But his plan failed when she only screamed after regaining consciousness. Stephen beat her in the head with a club until there was silence and proceeded to choke her to death. All this while their two-year-old daughter, Faith, was sleeping in the next room. He then took Trisha's body to a remote site where he had already dug a hole and readied a container with acid. It was there that he cut up her body with a chainsaw and buried her remains in an acid-filled container. This is the final interrogation that gets Stephen talking. Thanks. Yes. Do you need to use the bathroom or anything? Are you good? I know you might come over and ask you do you want water or anything. Yes. I think I said so we can check in on you and make sure. Um, you said you wanted to see Belon? This is Detective Yesenia Carde, who will be playing the role of good cop. Unlike the traditional interpretation of good cop as a friendly or sympathetic interrogator, here it emphasizes the detective's intelligence, resourcefulness, and ability to devise innovative methods to bring out the truth. In the good cop, genius cop scenario, the term good refers to the detective's proficiency and competence in investigative skills rather than their demeanor. For now, she's asking some basic questions to get the conversation flowing, but sticking to her role of being direct, she jumps on the matter at hand within 60 seconds. And Steve, I'm just, I, I know you're tired and I'm tired too. And I told you, I tried to be able to paint this picture of you and to keep you because now she's without both her mom and her dad. You know, and if things happen the way you said it happened, which I told you, I, and I, I understood everything you were saying yesterday. It took a long time to get it out of you and to try to understand. But if things happen the way you said it did, then there's there's really no reason why you shouldn't just take us to her. You know what I'm saying? That way we can prove, okay, or if there's no other injuries or anything on her, we can say, okay, well, it must have happened the way he said it did. And he just did a bonehead move and freaking brought her out here instead of calling 911 or taking her to a hospital. That's a misdemeanor compared to a, a freaking homicide charge. You know what I mean? Yes. So if things happen the way you said it did, I don't see why, I don't see why you're just not taking her to us, taking us to her, you know what I mean? That's the, it just, that just completely throws me off. You know, you, you've got to remember where you put her. That's just, that's not something, like I said, you don't, you didn't seem like that kind of person. It's like, is this the first time you've done this? If you get abused, straight up, cannot remember where you, where you put Trisha's body, where you put a human body and they're dead. You, is this the first time you've done this? How often do you do this to where you don't remember a, a specific location? That's the point. I've never done this. Okay. 
Huh. Where you, I don't so that's done. that's a day that you will remember for the rest of your life, I'm sure. That's a day you will forever remember. Yeah, a lot of it was, you know, panicking. You were freaking out, like you said. You couldn't reiterate it any more than you already have. You kept saying you were freaking out. There's there's no reason why. If that's how it happened, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to take, take me to it. can't take you, I don't know where. Mm. Is she in Martin County? I have no idea. I don't know where it is. But, but do you, see, when you do, you drive me crazy. When you do that and you get, you get the real low and you just, you close your eyes and it's, it's the same thing you did to me yesterday. You have to close your eyes and I don't know it. You know where she's at. Just like, remember when I kept telling you, why at 120? Why at 120 where you're in the car and you just, I don't have an answer for you. You did the exact same thing. It's the, I'm scared and I'm afraid to tell you where she is. I'm scared, I'm afraid to tell you what really happened. But if things happen the way you said it did, there's no reason. No reason why we shouldn't just go get her. If just me and you go, just me and you go, I'll, I'll take you right now. Just me and you, you take me to her. I can't take you to a place I don't know. That's the problem. I don't know where that place is. I can't point to it on a map because I don't know where it is. I'm not asking you to point to it on a map. I can't take you to it because I don't know where it is. I don't have a clue where that you is. You have to have some kind of clues. I cannot believe that. Do you think that a jury is going to believe that? That I you have no idea where you are? To, but that's the what, problem. Really? If I could tell Wouldn't you, you want them to? Which, don't you want closure on this? Don't you? If I could, you if not I could close tell it. you, I would tell you. If I could show you, I would show you. But I, I don't know where that is. Driving around today, none of that looked okay. anyway. Is familiar. it? Is it because that there wouldn't be anything of her left? There should be. I remember. I just, I just laid her down and I crossed her hands and I left her things with her, her phone and her, her wallet, and then I just, I just sat and I just, I just left, because I was hoping that I was wrong and that like she was gonna be okay and that it was just. I don't know. It was just like a spell or something. I don't know what. While Stephen claims to have driven his wife's body to a random location and left her there, the truth is entirely different. The detective does not know that yet, but she knows that Stephen is lying. Secondly, did you notice Stephen's physical response of closing his eyes and talking in low volume? It can indicate a defensive posture. In stressful situations, closing eyes acts as a mental barrier to block out external stimuli, and slumping can be a subconscious attempt to minimize confrontation or withdraw from the immediate situation. And lastly, Detective Carde can be seen physically closing the distance between her and Steven. It is an effort to create an environment that encourages both direct confrontation and open communication. Also, moving closer could be a tactic to subtly exert control. I, look, I want to believe you. I, I really, I really do. I want to believe you. And you know what? I know you've, you've said this over and over again, but just, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you, you've got the stage here. You tell me, you tell me from soup to nuts. I want to know everything that happened. And if there's something you left out before, there's something you left out before, now's the time to bring it. Now's the time to bring it. See, even look, from the beginning, look, let's I start with okay. where she is. I couldn't tell you then because even then okay. I didn't know where that then was. Then let's start. Then do me a favor. Then start with me. Twelve oh eight. I know you. You called her. You texted her. She comes over. You tell me from there what happened. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna stop you. I'm not gonna. Nothing. You tell me what happened from there. I'm not gonna put any words in your mouth. Doesn't matter anymore. I know. Why does it not matter? Of course it matters. Nothing I can say to show or prove anything, unless I can produce a body, which I can't produce this body because I don't know where the body is. I can't. I can't do anything. I can't convince you one way or the well, other. It does no. matter. I want you to tell me from soup to nuts, starting from midnight when she came over, around midnight when she came over. You tell me in your words what happened. You go from there and tell me what happened. I want to believe you. I want to be able to to lay it all out there for all the investigators, for all the everyone that's gonna be looking at this and be able to say this is what happened, this is his version. I'm not putting any words in your mouth. This is all coming from you. Okay? So you tell me what happened. She gets there. She gets there because you call her. 
Yes. Okay. What happens from there? She tends to faith. She tends to faith. Okay. It's the same stuff I've already told you. Go ahead, tell me again. She tends to faith. They're doing your paperwork. We're going to be sitting here, so you might as well talk to me. Right? It does matter. It doesn't matter, Jess. I can't produce a body, and therefore I can't, produce, I can't prove anything I'm telling you. And so Why it can't matter. you produce a body? Because I don't know where it is. I can't produce something. I don't have magic. I can't poof out of thin air. I don't know where that place was. You're telling me that you don't know where this place was, that you were just freaking out, but you were smart enough to think about packing extra clothes and taking it with you. I didn't pack extra clothes. That bag was already packed with just clothes. I never unpacked it. Okay, so but you were, you had it enough, you were together enough, to you had it together enough to say, I'm gonna bring extra clothes with me because you didn't have those clothes in her car, did you? No. Is there any reason why no. she had your rucksack? I don't know how, how you explained it yesterday. How she had extra clothes, your extra clothes in her car? That was my bag. I brought that bag. I brought that bag from North Carolina. It was okay. already packed with clothes. Okay. So you brought it from the house, but you put it in Trisha's car. I grabbed and it because you... I threw water in it. It was just a bag. I threw water and something to eat. And I was mm -hmm. like, if she comes to, maybe she'll be thirsty. Maybe she needs food. I just threw it in the bag. I didn't even unpack it. I just grabbed it. Okay. It was a bag. Okay. And you brought, what else? I just grabbed a bag. It's like, I would bag. feel I would feel so much better. I, honestly, I would feel so much better. You tell me, and you know that you try to give her a proper burial. You know that it, that you didn't just leave her out there. I can't bury her. I don't have a shovel. I didn't have anything to do any of that with. You didn't bring a small shovel with you. No, I don't even own one of those. I've never owned one of those. Okay. What could be the reason for such relentless denials? For one, it can undo his entire fake story. And two, Stephen's insistence on the importance of producing a body indicates a focus on material evidence. He's attempting to minimize the significance of verbal statements and redirect attention to the tangible proof, which he cannot produce. So he's trying to stick to his story to get a minimum sentence. Even a small percentage of the truth, if it comes out, can put Stephen behind bars. The only reason you would not take us to a body is because she didn't die the way you're explaining. And I can't tell you where that is, and I don't know where that is. I don't have any recollection of where that place is located. You remember making a right on Bridge Road. That's it. it just, and even and then, then, it's what? just a dark road. It's all I remember. We're just, I'm just driving, just a long dark road, just dark and straight. But took you out at night. Did that help jog your memory? Probably not, because it's dark out there. Everything, exactly. even during the day, it just looks like trees and grass, and trees and grass. And if we do it at night, it's just going to look the same, I'm sure, just trees and grass. I don't know where the place is. I have no idea where it is. You I don't have know. to have some recollection of where it is. And if I could, I would bring it. You can. And then you can see it. You can. I'm telling you. That's what I'm telling you. Stephen, you can. The only reason you're not is because she didn't die the way you're saying. She did. And that's why I freaked out so much. Because she did. Everything like that happened. And I freaked out because I'm trying to figure out why this is even happening. I've been good to her. I've been nice to her. I've given her her space. I've let her say whatever she wants to say. Do you, you know, think it should be so hard? I figured like it was a setup of some sort because she's set me up before in the past. And I'm thinking like, okay. So this is like some ultimate thing game kind of thing. I don't even know what you're trying to do at this point, and I don't know why you're trying to do it at this point. But once again, I can't, I can't pinpoint where she is in life at the time because she just goes from one side okay. to the other. Okay. Well, you're, you're talking about, about where she is at this point. I, are you talking about where she, where she was mentally at the point? Yes, like I mean, do I mentally need to get... and emotionally. I don't know. I just she just tells me one thing, and I just take it for a grain of salt because I don't believe it. I think she's just playing games. That's how I've always viewed her. Just playing games. I just don't really pay attention to most of it. I feel like it's just I don't know. She's just filling blank space. She's just talking to talk. 
right? Like there's there's so much more to it. You're just not. You're really just not. Uh, we show that to a jury. There's. There, there's no way for me to help you paint that picture. You're not finishing it. You're not finishing it. I can't tell them that. I can't tell them that. And without having her to prove your, to prove your defense, By now, you must have grasped why she's given the title of good cop. She directly points out his intention and attempts to be sly in a soft tone. Detective Carday's strategy involves confronting the disparity between Stevens' claims and the evidence, aiming to prompt a reconsideration of his position and push towards a more accurate account of the events. In the meantime, Stephen is using projection, a defense mechanism where individuals attribute their own undesirable traits or actions to others. By blaming Trisha for framing him, he seems to be deflecting responsibility and protecting his self-image. While Trisha is the one who lost her life, Stephen paradoxically positions himself as the victim. He seems to be feeling that cultivating a victim mentality will allow him to garner sympathy and understanding from others. I mean, honestly, do you even care? How are you going to explain that to her? How are you going to explain that to her? Do you expect her to believe that? When she gets older, do you expect your daughter to believe I have no idea how I'll ever explain any of that to her. I can't even explain it to you, um, much less her. But how are you going to look your child in the eye later on, when she's older, when she's asking you, where did you put my mother? It would be the same answer. I don't know. I don't know where that was. I don't know. Wow, so you literally, here's what you've done. is like you've literally tossed the future that you could possibly have with your child. You have tossed that completely away. Something as simply as taking us to where she's at, so we can prove your prove your statements. I see how simple you're saying it is. The problem is I don't know where that is. Why don't you know where because that is? Because I don't remember where that was. I don't know. I don't know what the road was. I don't know where the road was. I don't know any of that. It's just a really dark night. It was just dark. Mm -hmm. There were no signs. I didn't see any signs. I just drove, and then it was a dusty road, and then it was just dark, and I'm just sitting there. Because I don't know where the hell I am. I don't know why I'm even still out here, and I'm just sitting there now. Now what do I do? You call the police now? That looks great. You drove your ex-wife out to the God knows where the hell you even are. You don't have your phone to call anyway. So now, what do, you, like, what do you do now? What do you, and every, every Do you remember day, street back. signs? Do you see, do you remember no, seeing street names? I don't remember street signs. I don't remember anything as far as location. I just know it was a dirt road. It was a stupid dirt road, and it was stupid dark. I okay, so then, let's explain it to me. So, you make this right on Bridge Road. How long do you drive out? Approximately. No, I didn't. I didn't have a clock or a phone or, like, I didn't even have a watch on. I don't even know. Just spaced in my mind and just tried to make sense of stuff. And I just drove. And I didn't even know how fast I was. I just drove. I just drove. I just did you stay on that drove. road or did you make a right or left and go down the other roads? I don't know what roads. I just know that it was a dirt road when I laid her down. It was just I'm dusty and I'm dirt. sorry, Stephen. I, 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 I do not believe that. I do not believe that. I do not believe that. That's the explanation that I have to give to her family and to the jury. He doesn't know. By bringing Stephen's daughter into the conversation, the detective aims to evoke empathy and an emotional response. The question confronts Stephen with a hypothetical scenario where he must consider the emotional well-being of his daughter. It introduces an element of parental guilt and responsibility, encouraging him to reflect on the consequences of his actions on his family. Framing the question in terms of how Stephen would explain the situation to his daughter humanizes Trisha, making her more than just a victim in the detective's inquiry. This approach aims to shift Stephen's perspective from a self-controlled narrative to a broader consideration of Trisha as his own daughter's mother. But Stephen is adamant he would rather place blame on even a road by calling it stupid than accepting his crimes. I could just 
he wants to do this all the time, but he just is confused as to where he actually took her as opposed to anybody else. All the time? That's what I'm saying. Right. If I did it all the time, it'd be easy to remember. I do my job all the time. It's easy. I can do it without my eyes closed half the time. But I do it all the time. It's something I do. It's repetitive. I know. I've never done this. I've never dealt with any it's of this It's only been a month. That's a long time for something I haven't done before. I can't... If I took a new person to an aircraft and showed them one task and then waited a month and, hey, do that task again, they're not going to remember any of that. I have no idea a screwdriver. Good job. You know a whole lot more than that. It was a month ago now, and I don't remember any of where that is. There's... I don't remember any of that location. I can't bear... I don't have any means to bury her. I have no way to do anything with her. I just... So I just laid her down. You have gasoline? There was no gas. Yeah, there was, there was no gas. gas in that thing. There was like nothing. I put that gas in the car for her. What's the whole point of getting stupid gas anyway? Just put it in a stupid car. It's not big. I'm not sure I'm, I'm going anywhere. And you have to know. Uh, uh, Approximately a whole lot more than that. Maybe he's like, I guess it burns somebody. I imagine you need a crap ton more gas. Even a jet doesn't burn fuel that fast. It just doesn't. That's jet fuel. I imagine gasoline doesn't burn nearly that fast. I don't don't know where she is. What was she wearing? She still had her dress on. She had that bluish black dress. Mm. She had flip flops. Describing a contingency plan can be a way for Steven to maintain a sense of control in the narrative. Even in discussing a crime, he attempts to portray himself as methodical and in charge of the situation. We don't know Steven, but so far we can assume that he isn't a fan of self-reflection. It's fairly obvious that a criminal won't just confess to the crimes easily. But what's strange is the fact that he seems to be using an irritated tone while responding as if he's actually being framed for a crime that he did not commit. Irritation can function as a psychological defense mechanism to shield oneself from the emotional weight of guilt and shame. So by expressing irritation, Stephen might be creating a psychological barrier to deflect personal responsibility. Following this, the detective persistently inquired about why Stephen took Trisha's car. According to Stephen, Trisha had requested him to bring her work laptop and fill up her car with gas. When questioned about why Trisha would want him to use her car when there are gas stations on her route, Stephen asserted that he didn't question Trisha's decisions. He portrayed Trisha as somewhat careless, and he preferred not to scrutinize her choices. Besides, Stephen altered his account concerning Trisha's mobile phone. In a previous interrogation, he claimed the phone was dead, but in the current one, he stated that he turned it off, deeming it unnecessary. When confronted, Stephen consistently dismisses certain details as irrelevant to the case and swiftly moves on from those points. Stephen's selective disclosure of information allows him to present a version of the story that aligns with his desired narrative. And cell phone records do not lie. And the video surveillance is spot on exact time. That phone went off while you were in the car. Okay. 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 I turned it off. But what's the coincidence? It's right when we have. You make it a U-turn. Why turn it off? There's no... I'm asking you. I'm, I don't have a reason I'm, to. Are you sure nobody was trying to call it? No. I know I you said there was a guy... It. Why would I answer it? You said there was a guy's picture on the phone? Yeah, when she was taking Faith's pulse, mm-hmm. she went to unlock her phone with whatever the thing is to unlock it. I remember seeing there's a guy and while he was holding a puppet of some sort. Or yeah. I don't know what it is. I think it was a puppet. Yeah, that was I thought that was, I thought it was weird, but, mm-hmm. you know, that's who you like. Maybe, I thought maybe he was famous in some way, and she saw his act or a show, and that's why she had it on her phone. Or maybe that was the guy she was talking about. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until talking to Chassie. When was she taking the baby's heart rate? When she came over the first time. Eight o'clock is when you saw, that when you last saw that phone in her hand. But yes. the next time she came over, that phone was clearly in the car. It was in the car. Yeah, it was in the car. It was in the car, yes. And do you remember shutting it off? No, I didn't turn it off. I had no reason to... Did you put it on airplane mode? No, I, I don't even have access to the phone. I don't know what her pin code is. I don't know if it's a slide. You don't need thing. a pin code to shut it off. What? I'm telling you that phone went off when you were in the car with it. I didn't turn it off. Then what happened to it? I don't know. I remember leaving the phone with her. When I laid her down, I gave her the phone so that she could call someone. 
And the event, if she woke up and was like, oh, shit, where am I? Hey, at least I have my phone. So you remember as someone. much detail as Tommy that, you know, we laid her down, we crossed her hands, right? Yeah, How'd you put her, how'd you put her hands? Down, just down on her things. I got with her, like, I can't show you, but yes. And left no, show, show me as best as you can. How did you leave her? I just laid her down. Like she had her dress and I laid her down on her back and I just put her hands down. And that way she had her things. They were all like, Right. Just what things are those? What did you leave with them? Her phone and her wallet. So she had ID. She had money if she needed it, I guess. She had her phone so she could call for a ride. How much money did she have in there? I have no idea how much money was in there. I just left it because it's hers and there you go. Mm -hmm. So you remember as much detail as that, but again, you don't remember I don't know where, where that was? I don't know where it is. I didn't look for geo references. I didn't do anything. I just was like, I'm just going to lay you down and hope to God that I'm wrong. And just hope you're not hope that I'm wrong and you're okay. And that when you wake up, you can call someone and you can get back home or whatever. Because I don't want anything else to do with this stupid night. The repeated use of the word stupid can be considered as a form of displacement, where Stephen is expressing anger or frustration indirectly by applying the term to external elements. By attributing negativity to external factors, Stephen might be attempting to distance himself from personal responsibility. The choice of language is usually a manifestation of frustration, dissatisfaction, or distress that one experiences, but may not be able to fully express it. You just made... You've made so much effort to cover it up and cover your steps. I just didn't mention it because it didn't even seem significant to go get this laptop that I didn't even go get. You didn't think it was significant to tell significant to tell the first four or five interviews that you had found her passed out in your house? Allegedly passed out in your house? Because I didn't know how to even explain side. that. How do I explain that? How do I tell you that, yeah, I came back and she either hit her head or she banged her head against something or I don't know what, but she was not responsive. And I freaked out. And then, of course, the question goes to Doug, did you hit her? No, I didn't hit her. I would never lay my hand on her like that. But you're a smart, you're a smart guy, Stephen. There's no reason. Why, why didn't you just call now? Because I freaked out because all I'm thinking about is how this looks. This looks like I did something and I did nothing. I didn't ask for this. I didn't push this. I didn't, I did nothing to warrant this. I just, I went to get your laptop, which I thought was done when I didn't do. And then I realized you didn't have gas. And I told you like, Hey, you have next to no gas in your car. So let me get you some gas. Like, well, Otherwise, you may not make it. You passed the gas station on the way back to the house. Why didn't you just put some gas for her? Because it wasn't my money. I wasn't going to spend my money to put gas in her car to her car. She just spent her money. But you were going to drive to get her laptop? Why are you drive to get a laptop? If it's her laptop. She why should she just get it? I don't think it's such a big deal that why she Why pass the gas station on your way back to the house? Because I'm you not spending my money on her. You couldn't put a dollar or two in there for her? It's, it's not my money. Like, I'm not spending my money on her things. Like, I don't want to get the laptop. Okay. That makes that sense. Was, just that, that doesn't make sense to me. She wanted her laptop so that she could. That's silly because once again, you could just wait until you leave. So you were going to leave. You left the house tomorrow. at one in the morning to go get a laptop. Yes, and halfway there, I'm like, this is dumb. This doesn't make any sense. And I think she was wearing the car by then. No, she wasn't. She, she was wearing so the car by then, and that's the last thing you need to get is to run out of gas. Run out of gas. Run out of gas, gas with her in the car. Then I would just leave the car, like... Like you did the second time? No, I would just leave it where it ran out of gas. If it ran out of gas then, like, why get gas for it? That's just dumb. I would just leave it. If it's out of gas, it's out of gas. It's not my car anyway. I was only trying to be nice. Once again, hey, you have next to no gas in your car. You should do something about that now because you notoriously don't put gas in your car. Just like she had already told me, yeah, I was going to put gas in in the morning. And I'm like... That's silly when you could have already put gas in it. You could have put gas in it 101 times by now. But if she was leaving, why not just tell her to go get gas or something? Because it just makes sense to take care of it now. I just said, hey, if you have money, I'll get you gas. I'll put a gas can, whatever. Yeah, I have a 20. After looking around the house for a gas can, and there wasn't one, she had a 20. I got the gas can. I got the gas. I put it in her car. It's like, here, here's a gas can. So in the future, when you run out of gas, because it'll happen again, knowing you, at least you have a gas can. They're like, go get gas. Or if some passerby or sees you that's kind enough to take your gas can for you and bring back gas, mm -hmm. 
you're good. You know, like you at least have a gas can because you're going to do this again. That's how I looked at it. Like, this is something you're going to do because even when we were married, this wasn't the first time she brought out of gas. Like, I think it was two or three times since we were married that she brought out of gas and had to call me to come bring her gas. And I remember it once was in South Carolina by some dealership and they were kind enough to give her gas before I got there. And another time was near the house, but not, no, which is near that one. So it was somewhat convenient. And then once she almost ran out of North Carolina, but I think she said she like sputtered into the station or whatever. And I'm thinking, well, that's not necessary. You could just put gas mm-hmm. in the car. So I looked at it as, I'm just going to keep you from running out of gas because that's not going to be good for you or her now. The two of you stranded, no gas. Engaging in victim shaming may be a strategy for self-preservation. By portraying Trisha as careless, Stephen is attempting to protect his own self-image and deflect responsibility for any negative outcomes. The detective's assertive stance contrasts with Stephen's resistance to the suggestion of calling 911. This dynamic may reflect power struggles and attempts to control the narrative, like the detective is trying to challenge his smartness by saying, you're a smart guy, and Stephen remains adamant but ends up giving a detailed description of a fairly unrelated matter. It can reflect Stephen's inclination to provide extensive justifications in the face of a more confrontational approach by the detective. To watch that video of us yesterday, okay? You're going to have the opportunity for that. You didn't give that option of the laptop after I had, I had to, I had to feed it to you. Because I didn't have an answer to give you. I I, explained no, that. All you kept saying was, I don't have an answer for you. I don't, I don't, hold on. Oh, you kept saying, I don't have an answer for you. I don't have an answer for you. And I wasn't taking that answer because we both know it's Because it doesn't okay. make sense. You're right. It didn't make sense. Exactly. I had to Even feed it to you. I had to say, did she ask me to go get something? Did she, oh, yeah, she asked me to get her laptop. So you see what I'm saying? You wouldn't give me an answer until I, I gave you a suggestion. Because that's what happened, though. Okay. So, yeah. But at the same time, it didn't make sense then. And that's the only reason why I didn't go get it. I know something better. I could prove she was running in that car. Okay. You know why? You leave the gas station at 156. Okay. And then you leave at 204. There's no way in hell. Remember when I asked you in the house today? When I asked you in the house today, what did you do when you came in the house? You said, oh, you found her, you were freaking out. Yes, I paced. You I like, paced? I stood and then I paced. 58, my dear one, two, three, four. So, from when you left the gas station at 156 mm-hmm. and get back to the house, so I say 157, 158, because it's right down the street. No, you're telling me that open. you're telling me that in those very few minutes you found her pass out tried to assess her pacing went and put her in the car because you and again on video you're oh we're gonna get a walk through that you're that you're freaking out you're walking back and forth pacing but you grab your bag of clothes or you you said you put water and then you leave again and like like, you literally did all this in, like, five minutes? All I thought was, I just don't want you here. I don't want you. I didn't know what else to do. I just didn't want her to She was in that car already. She was not. I just did didn't you get her messed up on your times? Did you get messed up on your times thinking, okay, maybe was it? No, because she was already in that car. She wasn't. I had to drag her into the stupid thing. And then even then, I just, I just didn't want her there. I just want her to go back home. And go home. Yeah, to drag her alone. Well, not drag, drag, like by her arms. Just I picked her up, and then, yeah, I laid her to the side of the car, and then I pulled her through the car. And I closed the door, and I got in the car, and I cranked it, and I'm getting it. So, those the heck. few minutes you're sitting there, and you're the pacing, the freaking out, not knowing what to do. Because I didn't you know what to do. You carried her from the bedroom. You carried her from the bedroom. And you ran and you laid her out in the living room. Do you remember telling me that? Yes, I brought her to the living room. Okay. So I could see there was a better light. Okay. So you at that point try to do CPR, call 911, 
You don't tell me that. You go and put her in her car. Yes, and I can take her home, is what I thought. I can just take her home and she but can be out of my hair. But you didn't. Because you wanted her out of here and you got it. Because I do. You got it and I'm going to prove it. Not in that you sense. I wanted got her it. to go home. So she can you sent her home, home already. Right. And not just be See, but crazy you sent her home, home already. Right. Right. That is way too short. That's even a short, much shorter time period than what I originally thought when I was talking to you yesterday. She was already in that car. Stephen, she was in that car already. You put her in the car, and when you were driving south on US 1, hear me out. You were driving south on US 1, and you realized, oh, I'm running out of gas. That's the last thing. Because you can't leave her body in the car with no gas. Why not? Why not? Because you got to get rid of it like you did. So much of the point that maybe you're freaking out. Maybe you're freaking out. You don't know where you went. I could just leave then. If that's what you're, I could just leave. I could just leave and walk back. Like, just leave it. It's her car and leave it and walk back then. There really is no emotion in there. There's really, there really is nothing there for her, huh? What are you talking about? I'm you just, wanted I her what you're saying. I wanted her to not be dead in my home. I wanted whatever this was to not be affecting me the way it was. So you didn't want her dead in your home. Let's highlight some traits of a good cop. They're concise and to the point when conveying information or asking questions, and assertiveness and no-nonsense attitude are key qualities. While direct, they also possess effective communication skills. They can convey information clearly and can adapt their communication style based on the situation. So far, we can see all of this happening in the interrogation room. Detective Carde is noticing the inconsistencies and pointing them out, but Stephen does not even fumble enough to be noticed for it. He does retract his statement, which can highlight some anxiety, but his ease in switching to different reasoning suggests cognitive adaptability, which gets unusually high when a person is trying to lie his way out of a stressful situation. Stephen's unflustered responses suggest a resistance to external influence. What we can say for sure is that Stephen has made up his mind about a narrative. He seems to have given it a thorough thought, and now he's passionately sticking to his pre-planned narrative. Come on in. Good job. Please. It's not back at all. Oh, we haven't met yet. What's your name? Stephen. With a P or a B? B. Okay. I just got a couple quick. I've had an opportunity to listen to some of your statements to Jesse today. Um, I haven't been involved from the very beginning, and there's just a couple of things in my mind I need to clear up. So if you don't mind answering a couple of questions, I'd appreciate it. Do you mind talking to me? Sure. Okay. And, and you've been very cooperative, and I understand you flew down here with these guys, and I guess you even stayed in the same hotel room and so forth on the way down. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And they told you all of your rights and everything, and you've indicated that you have no problem cooperating with them. Is that how you feel about this? Yes. Okay. And, and certainly, I appreciate that. I assume that what you're trying to do is put this all behind you. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. This is Detective Michael Oliver, the genius cop. Right from the very beginning, he's employing an empathetic approach, perhaps recognizing Stephen's inclination to blame the victim, Trisha. Recognizing a potential psychological dynamic in the interrogation where Steven seems keen on blaming Trisha, Detective Oliver has devised a creative perspective. If a confession is to be obtained, it will involve emphasizing Trisha's role. Instead of directly challenging Steven, he aims to understand his perspective and redirect accountability, using empathy to establish rapport. Um, so, the only thing I heard you and Jesse talk about, and I just got here, was... Obviously, the night that your ex-wife disappeared, but there was something that you had mentioned about kind of referring to drama, her drama, or her being dramatic. Can you kind of expound on that for me? Because I'm not quite sure I follow what you meant, that she talked a lot and was kind of dramatic. Tell me what you mean by that. She's always overly dramatic in her storytelling. Everything's bigger than what it really was. Everything was more exciting than it really was. So that's just how she is. That's how she... She likes to embellish her stories. And the redhead. And I'm like, that's fine. I don't care. Once again, we mm -hmm. divorce. I have my own life. You have your own life. If you want to embellish your stories, I don't embellish your It doesn't matter to me. I don't care. Right. You know, this. How, how long were you guys married? Almost 11 years. People get divorced for any number of reasons, but the dynamics of your relationship post. I don't even want to call it divorce because you were separated for a longer period of time than that. It was fairly amicable. I mean, you all got along? Sometimes. Uh, 
I don't know why, but whenever we were in person, she was very nice and very amicable. Yeah. But anytime, like via Skype or over the phone, it was she was a different person. Um, it was more of a you need to do this and you have to do that and you owe me this. And I'm thinking, I don't owe you anything. Like, I'm giving you everything I'm supposed to. I've done everything I'm supposed to do and then some. And I don't know why you feel like I still owe you something or why I'm still obligated to do something for you. You know. So you, did you have a child sharing arrangement and child uh, support payments that you had to make and all that? Yes. And you were making all that? Of course. Okay. And so when, why do you think she acted differently when you would be not face-to-face versus when you were on the internet? I don't know any about that kind of nonsense. Okay. So I mean, and even not, even, I don't know. Like it, me and Laura always like, look, it's Laura's there for some of our Skype questions and she would see how she would just act. It just, she just wasn't the same person over Skype. And I told her, like, when I'm there, she's never like this. Like, she doesn't act that way. She doesn't act this full of herself. You, like, you know, mightier than thou. Like, she doesn't act like that when I'm in person with her. And I don't understand that. Why? Over electronic means or whatever. You're, you're just not the same. You ever hear of the concept of beer muscles? You know what beer muscles are? You're in the military. You gotta know. You know? You know how some guys drink and they get... They get mouthy and they get aggressive and they, you know what I mean? They call that beer muscles. So they might not act like that when they're not drinking. Do you think that she felt like she could treat you poorly when you all weren't face to face? You know, and she didn't have to worry about maybe any physical reproductions or getting into any, you know, problems with you when you're over the internet? Do you think that could be it? It was just more of her trying to push buttons because she yeah. can. She likes to get a rise out of me and anyone, honestly, like I said. Even when we first got married, she would... Steven's willingness to open up suggested developing trust with the male detective. Trust is crucial in interrogations, and Stephen may perceive the detective as more understanding or relatable. Stephen's description of Trisha's tendency to exaggerate and seek certain behaviors suggests a motive behind her actions. The detective's use of a military phrase, veer muscles, reflects an attempt to use relatable words to understand Trisha's personality through Stephen's lens. Incorporating familiar terms can establish rapport and facilitate communication, and it worked here. At the moment, they're discussing everything but the central questions of where Stephen disposed of Trisha. However, this is all right, even good. This strategy establishes a foundation, and there's a possibility that a confession could be coming soon. Most of the time in your relationship, when things got difficult or heated, it always had something to do with money. I think we, you and I have been talking for 10 minutes. <clears throat> Money's come up. Four or five times. And that always happens in divorce situations. I don't have any issues yeah. uh, that we argued about. Just, there's always a circle of things. Um, same arguments. Just as a point where there were no same topics in the home. And I just decided I was done. I don't want to, I don't want to live like this. I want to live in a miserable yeah. home where every time I open my mouth, we're arguing. And it didn't seem to matter about what it was, you know. And I just grew up in a happy home with one parent. Then they grew up in a miserable home with two parents where they fight and yell all the time. In these period of years after the separation arguments, once you all aren't living together anymore, I understand once once you're in a relationship that doesn't work, there's no fixing it. And I get, you know, what you're saying there. But in terms of disputes or disagreements you all would have post-separation, did you find that they were always or primarily about money? No. The only thing we really argued about was... It, it upset me that she didn't prioritize that. Um, in her mind, it was more, but if I don't, then sorry for you. I'm like, uh, all I'm asking for is 10 to 15 minutes, Monday through Friday, that's it. And if you need to move the time, let me know. If you know you're not going to be there at 5, don't wait till 5.50 something to tell me you're not going to come online. Tell me at 3. Tell me at noon. Just tell me, hey, today's not a good day. Even. Can we try again tomorrow? Fine. I'm very flexible that way. No, it's me along. But yeah, I'll, I'll okay. go to arcade on my line and then she's like, oh, 10 minutes. Okay, I'll wait 10 minutes. 30 minutes go by. Oh, I'll be on five. Another 20 minutes go by. Okay. The detective uses an open-ended question, similar to what psychologists do. Open-ended questions encourage individuals to share detailed and nuanced information. In this case, the detective's approach allows Stephen to freely express his thoughts and concerns without being constrained by specific prompts. He successfully receives a detailed answer, covering both the crucial aspects related to this case, like money and custody of their daughter. Both these areas are important because they hint as the potential motive behind the crime. Responses related to money and custody often carry emotional weight, 
analyzing Stephen's emotional tone and the way he addresses these concerns are an insight to his frustration. And surprisingly, these two things turn out to be the motives after all. For the next 20 minutes, Detective Oliver asks him to narrate his version of the events before the crime happened to establish a timeline. And now it's time to evaluate how many times Stephen changed his story. 12 something in the morning, you got to breakfast place. And the last time I heard anything about this case, the last time I had been briefed on anything that happened to this case was <clears throat> three weeks ago mm -hmm. when everything happened. And you were cooperating with law enforcement and you told them what happened from the 28th, the 27th. Uh, what what did you tell them? Because that what what I heard today is not the same as what you told them. What did you tell them the first time you spoke to the cops about what happened that day? I didn't tell them about her wanting to go get her laptop. But well, I, okay, but what did you tell them that she just hung out there for a while and and was out of gas or something? Tell me about that. I told them that she came over to meet her here. Okay, like, great. Because I so want to spend time with her, and then I said that she left. And that's when she discovered she didn't have gas. Okay, so you told them that she went out, got her, got to her car, didn't have gas, and then what, came back? Yes. And then you did what? And then I went around looking for gas through the home. Okay. The gas can. I'm and the guy gas. next door, the, the Chinese fella or, or Japanese or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you spoke with him trying to get a gas can from him, that guy, right? Yes. Okay, did you know, I mean, did you see him over there? Could you see him from where you were standing? Because he saw you all night. He could see you coming and going or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if, obviously you must have been able to see him because you went over and asked him for a gas can. Uh, no, I didn't see him. How I did you know to go over there and ask for a can? Uh, I heard his song. Okay. He was, I don't know if it's playing a game or messaging someone gotcha. or something like that. And when I was standing outside, I heard the phone. And I was like, well, perfect. If someone's awake, I can ask them for a gas can. Because obviously I'm not going to knock on random people's doors at whatever time right. it is. Okay. Ask for a gas can. But if you're awake and you're outside on your porch, okay, okay sure, I can approach you and hopefully ask for a gas can. Right. And he didn't speak English, right? Dad, bring somebody into an interpreter for you. Right. I assume and you don't speak. I don't. I didn't know what language it was. <laughs> okay. So, but, right. yeah, a woman comes from inside. Yeah, he doesn't hold on, and the woman comes from inside. He has no gas, so my understanding is then you got in your car with the can, and went off and got her a couple of gallons of gas and whatever, right? I had to purchase it, but yeah. Okay, right, well, right. Yeah. All right, and you were, at that time, the video reflects what you were wearing. Do you remember what you were wearing? Yeah, it was just standing up and sleeping in every night already. It was just a red shirt and some shorts. So okay. They're comfy. Okay. okay. All right. Um, so then you go back, and then your story is what after you get the gas? Then I go back and I put gas in the car. And then what? And then she leaves. Okay. All right. And now, so that's, then that was the last time you saw from her, heard from her, had any knowledge of her. That was your story, right? Yes. Now, what I asked them to do to make sure is, look, you got to go back up. You got to talk to Mr. Williams. We got to make sure we got these time frames down. You got to make sure that, and you, consistently told that story exactly that way multiple multiple times right yes okay and so then today i was surprised when they called me and said you know there's some additional stuff that he's adding on so let's talk a little bit about that because that's it doesn't make sense <laughs> you know it just doesn't make sense and you understand that i've heard you say in here multiple times you know how this is stupid stupid this stupid that doesn't make any sense so I want you and I to make sense of this while we have an opportunity, okay? So now walk me through, Trisha shows up. The detective is using a tactic which is called a gentle challenge in psychology. It involves addressing inconsistencies or discrepancies in a considerate and understanding manner. Psychologically, it recognizes that people might make mistakes or change their stories for various reasons, and offering a gentle challenge creates a space for them to provide more accurate information without becoming defensive or shutting down. The genius cop is employing every empathetic strategy there is to avoid creating any hostility. Steven narrates his recent version of the story that he had just finished completing for Detective Carde. The first thing that popped in my mind when I heard this change in your story adding in the, the, the going to get the laptop thing is why don't you get the gas right now why are why are we going through all of these motions to go search for a gas can 
Uh, I didn't want to pay for the gas. And and that's, another, that's another theme you and I keep having. There's money, you're just money, money, money. You keep talking about money. I mean, what are we talking about? Four bucks? For me, it, was, it wasn't just the fact that it's four dollars. It's like the principle that I shouldn't have to put gas in your car. We're not together. It's like I shouldn't have to pay for your cell phone if we're not right. together. I shouldn't. You know, they shouldn't have to do these things for you. Like, getting the last one, should you be doing? But you're not, you're not, here's the problem with that. See, if you're not doing it for her, you're kind of doing it for faith. Like, I heard what you said was, look, I'm going to put that your little gap in, put it in there next time because she's towed my daughter around. She'll have a can in the car. Right. You know what I mean? So she can maybe get gas or whatever. So, surely, guys, I'm going to go by the whole situation. The last thing we do is spend any money on you to put gas in your car. All right. So I just drive it back, and then I tell her, like, you need to put gas in your car. And we talk about, like, you know, why you don't have gas or whatever. And she talked about getting gas in the morning. But it's the same time I've heard before. All right, but so at that point in time now, you get back, you don't have a laptop. That couldn't have gone over very well. Well, I explained why I didn't go get it. And, yeah, she didn't. I mean, she wasn't very happy. But, once again, like, the gas. I told her if the gas is more present, basically. But you didn't know about the gas until after you abandoned the laptop. Well, on the project. Yes. Yeah. So I told, you know, so I come back, she asked, like, you know, to my laptop, and I told her, like, yeah, I didn't go get it, and you don't have gas. Did she get hot? Did that get heated? I mean, did she get upset? No, I think she just kind of, like, realized it was a stupid errand to go on anyway. Because, like I said, I didn't really argue very much, but at the same time, my whole premise was this is why. They like, just can wait. Okay, so let's just stop here now, because there's now this whole... Again, one of the reasons I wanted them to make sure when they talked to you back when all this went down was because the sure sign that somebody, you've ever heard the concept of the consciousness of guilt? You know what that means? People might act in a certain way or do a certain thing that leads others to believe they did something wrong. Like, for instance, people who run from the cops, what, you're, what do you think they're doing? Right. They're right, they're running because they did something wrong. People who lie, why? Because they're covering something up. Okay? So the first thing I need you to get me over is how you could tell them this initial version of events and leave out this whole, as you said multiple times, stupid laptop thing. Because it was stupid and it didn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to this day. I don't understand why right. it was in a fool there or a laptop. But you see, the, the fact, you, you keep kind of making the argument, which is it doesn't make sense. And when some, something doesn't make sense, it's generally not true. And so you not saying that originally and now coming up with it will make people think, well, geez, he's got he's to change his story to meet facts or information that maybe he thinks, you know, is now important. And I don't, it, it would, you, you could have very easily said to Jesse the first time, look, we want to get the laptop. I, I relented because I didn't want to get an argument with her. I drove half the way and I said, hell with her, and I came back. But then when they confront you with the fact that they've got her car going down the road and doing the turn, now you plug this laptop thing in. That doesn't look good. Do you agree with me? I understand. If, we, if I got up and I sat over there and you sat here, what would you think of me telling you that? Probably the way you feel. Right? Yeah. Okay. But even when they asked about me washing my car, I was like, now, if you know me, my car is always clean. God, I was driving at 700 plus miles. I just wanted to get clean before I drove it another 700 back. I yeah. smashed more bugs into it. Uh -huh. And I didn't plan to wash it that weekend when I got back. But I didn't. So. Right. Well, and you're, you know, it's like, you could, you could look at one fact and say, ooh, that's suspicious. But then in a broader context, which you know the whole story, which... I accept you're kind of like a fastidious, clean guy, you're orderly, you, so you clean your car. It doesn't, it doesn't yeah, really mean a lot. Like I said, my daughter threw it all the back seat. Well, that helps. I didn't have any okay. to really clean it, so I wiped it up, but that was it. All right, so so we we are in agreement that you agree with my assessment that it it's suspicious that you would tell the story the same way over and over and over, but yet then when confronted by the cops, with an additional piece of evidence, you would add a fact that would conveniently explain uh, what they discovered. You agree with me that that should give somebody some cause or cause for concern? It is left out because it was stupid. Just like going to 
what was it? Sally B just bought it. Asked like, oh, what did you buy there? And I was like. Instead of using straightforward phrases like you're lying, tell me the truth, like the good cop did, the genius cop is using the term consciousness of guilt. This legal concept involves assessing outward indicators that suggest a person may be feeling guilty. Accusing someone directly of lying can trigger defensiveness, making the person less likely to cooperate. By explaining the concept of consciousness of guilt, the detective provides a more nuanced approach that allows Stephen to save face and offer clarifications without feeling attacked. Plus, drawing attention to inconsistencies may create a sense of cognitive dissonance for Stephen. This psychological discomfort can motivate individuals to resolve discrepancies by providing a more accurate or truthful version of events. Because we talked a little bit, we kind of came to an agreement. You and I, I think, on the super little things and the big things. Mm -hmm. And the super little things might be something you unintentionally forget to mention, and it's human nature and it's understandable. But then the big things, you know, there really is no explanation for for those. You you didn't tell those guys that. And again, how about you ever hear the concept or the term that the truth is immutable? Mm -hmm. You know what that means? No, it's a no. Yeah, well, what it means is it never changes, mm -hmm. right? The truth is always the truth. I mean, you can't change because that wouldn't be the truth. And when people tell different versions of the truth, we come back to this concept of consciousness of guilt. We talked about it earlier, remember? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that's a real big thing, Mr. Williams, that you come back and Trish is laying on the floor with an injury. And if you leave something like that out, suspicious minds are going to think that's not true. That sounds to be a lie. It sounds like somebody's trying to cover something else up. Why didn't you tell them that the first time? Because I had no way to explain how that happened. I had no way to explain how I come back and she's on the floor, other than them just assuming I did it. And I would never do that to her. I would never hurt her. It's just not me. I don't. Ooh, right, which, know, made, which, makes, which makes it even more reasonable that you would have told him that from the outset. I never hurt this woman. I love this woman. I would never do any of this woman. I came in and she's laying on the floor. Let me, let me make it one step easier. Where is, your, where is your cell phone at this moment? Somewhere in the home. In the home, right? When, what about the house itself? Does the bed and breakfast have a landline? I don't know. Okay, but you know... You, you're a sharp kid, you know, 911, boom, cops are there, ambulance, she gets treatment, right? But I didn't. Hold on. You, this, I'm going to ask the question just simply, but you know that's how 911 works, right? Yes. You pick up the phone, you call, and you say, there's something wrong with my ex-wife, please send an ambulance, right? Yes. And you did not do that, right? No. Now, again, I'm going to get up and I'm going to take your seat, you're going to sit here. Come on. Because of how it looks. All I thought about at that moment is how does this look? You, you can't fix how this looks. There's no other way to say. Here's the problem with that. I, I, okay, fine. That, okay, I'm, I'll concede that for the purpose of our conversation here. But you told them she's still breathing. I checked. She, it was just shallow. Okay, but my point is she's alive. You had an opportunity to save her life. By simply calling 911. And how it looks comes out in the wash. I mean, you say she fell down or whatever. I mean, what what happened to her in eight minutes from when you left to get gas and you come back to see her on the floor? I don't know. And that's the problem. Because all I'm thinking is, in the past, she... This, this, is, this is a game. This is some sort of, like, I'm setting you up. I'm I'm killing myself. I'm going to kill myself to say well, I don't think she was intending to kill herself, but I just feel like she did something, it didn't work the way she intended it, it went too far or whatever, and now it's I'm screwed because I can't explain this. I don't know what this is. I don't know what she's trying to pull. I don't know why even, because I don't know. I just don't know why you would do this to me. When, as far as I could tell, you moved on. But all, all you, again, all you saw was this little abrasion to her forehead and she was lying on the floor. Well, the right? abrasion was after it turned over. Yes. Okay, one thing I want to make sure, 
sure later on here is he's, he's originally you had made some say you didn't know if she instead of calling 911 he thought it was wise to take her to a remote location and leave her there even in his version of the story he could have saved her but he didn't because he didn't want to get framed he not only comes off as a remorseless and cunning man but also as a selfish person who would prioritize self even before someone's life yeah just here you go yeah you're fine and then how are you gonna get home i was gonna walk However far, just walk it home and just, just leave. Just be out of there, be nowhere around you because this craziness, I can't deal with it. Just other reason why we're divorced. I can't, I don't want drama, I don't want crazy in my life. You know, I just, I like simplicity. Mm -hmm. And right, and so this, so your plan, your simple plan was to leave her in the car at her brother's house. Now I understand that when you first started, when your, when your story began to evolve last night or yesterday, you initially told them that you actually did take her over and leave her in front of her brother's house in the car, right? That's what I wanted to do, yes. No, well, no, no. I thought, did, did he say he did it? Yes. You said to them, and remember, all this is, you know this is recorded, obviously, you're a smart guy. And the reason we do that is for your protection and for ours, so it can't be said that we did or said anything that isn't recorded for all time's sake. You're on video telling these guys that you did that, that you left her in front of the house at your brother's, right? Yes. That's a lie. Yes. What kind of people lie? Innocent people or guilty people? Guilty. Yeah. And so, why did you lie about that? I mean, to, I, I'd like to keep track because, first of all, we have, I can't tell you how many lies you would have told because every time, there's a lie by omission, too, by not mentioning something. Every time you told them about how this incident went down right after Trish's disappearance, you left out the whole laptop thing, not to mention all this other stuff. So those were all lies. Um, now you lied to them later on about returning to her house. Why are you lie? Why are you? Tell me why you lied. Because all of it looks bad. Right. It, makes, it, it looks much worse than a lie. I just wanted to leave her home and then be done. Mr. Williams, when a jury watches this video tape, and what they see is a continual, constant evolution and then lies in that evolution of the story, they're going to get somewhat suspicious. It's going to create some concern in their mind that you did something wrong. You, you, would you agree with that? No, I just wanted, I didn't have a plan. I, I didn't know what to do. All I wanted was just to be done with this night. But then that's, well, the very first time you met with them, you should have said, this is, the, this is what happened. I didn't know what to do. I had no plan. I, this is crazy. I don't know how to explain it. But you lied when you first talked to them, didn't you? Yes. And then you lied again to them yesterday when you talked to them initially for a while, right? Yes. And then when your story started changing, you lied even in your new story because it's changing the, from yesterday to today, right? No. That you took her and left her in the car in front of her trailer. You told them that, right? Yes. And that was a lie. So that's a change, right? Yes. Okay. So I just want to, you and I are on a road now. And this road, I promise you, will end at the truth. Okay? When, when you leave that house with Trish in the backseat of the car. As the interaction progresses and the conversation shifts towards more critical topics, the suspect may feel a sense of obligation or loyalty towards the good cop due to the positive rapport established earlier. It's a direct example of why such a nuanced and strategic approach to interrogation that leverages the psychological impact of building trust can be useful in the interrogation room. But Stephen does not seem that easy. No matter what our good cop and genius cop try, they're not successful so far. For two hours, you're driving around, or I should say, you're doing something. You couldn't be driving too much, right? Because you only got about two gallons of gas in that car. So you couldn't have been driving the whole time, right? Right. Okay. So you drove somewhere, and, and you don't know where, you don't know this one big thing, but you know you drive somewhere down, I guess you told them a dirt road, right? It was dusty. So dusty. Was dirt. Now, they told you there was dust underneath the undercarriage of her car. Is that why you then said it was a dusty, dirty road, or was it really a dusty road? It was really a dusty road. You know, a lot of times, what I just want to make sure of something here. I think I know the answer to this. But a lot of times what people will say is, well, the detective said X, Y, and Z. And I was just repeating that to make them happy. I was just saying what the detective said. Nobody's putting any words in your mouth here. Is that correct? Yes, the road was a dusty road. Right. I'm talking about the whole shebang, sir. 
Nobody's putting words in your mouth what happened the morning of April 27, 2016, when your wife disappears, right? This is your story. These are the facts as you remember them, right? Uh, so far, yes. Okay. Okay. If I at any point in time say something that's putting words in your mouth, please feel free to make it known to the record that, that I'm doing that. So we got two hours. There's no way on God's green earth you're driving to Trisha's, and we also incidentally we pulled the gas tank out of the car, and we know how much gas was left in the car. So these things are not looking real good for you. Mm -hmm. And we know that how much gas you bought from the gas station, and just do a little bit of math, figure out what the mile per gallon is on that vehicle, and we know about how much driving you could do. And you sure as hell can't drive for two hours on that kind of gas. Do you think that? Probably fair to say? You put the gas in. Sure. Sure. So that means you weren't driving the whole time, you were doing something else. I said I wasn't driving the whole time. I just said I spaced and I drove. You spaced and you drove. Just tried to figure all this nonsense out. Did you go right, right? And as she's laying in the back of the car, your conscience, I asked you this earlier, I asked you if you had a conscience. Your conscience never kicked in and said, Maybe she's still alive. Maybe I should take this opportunity to save a human life. Not just a human, but the mother of my child. Did, did that ever kick in in the two hours when you're driving around with her in the backseat of your car? So you're insinuating because I didn't think that I don't have a conscience? It's, well, well, yeah, no, I'm not insinuating. I'm saying it. That doesn't mean I don't have a conscience. Of course I have a conscience. It's just that thought never came to me. I mean, how could, what could be more important in the grand scheme of things than the preservation of human life? And I'm talking human life for somebody you don't even know. Not somebody who is the mother of your now orphan child, or motherless child, I should say. So it's, I'm not asking you just randomly, how would you feel about this, Mr. Williams? I'm saying, you know, two hours with her in the backseat of this car, it never dawned on you, I'll just have to deal with the consequences. I hope they believe me, but I need to see what I can do to save her life. That never dawned on you. Didn't know what to do to save her life. Oh, let's see. 911. Did you have your phone with you when you were out there? Did you even think to grab it? No, you didn't think to grab it. And you know why? Because you know we can follow you with your phone. You know that, right? I mean, everybody knows that we can follow a cell phone. Yeah, grab a Yeah, right. I grabbed food in case she woke up. Yes. Okay. But but you didn't take your phone with you. No, I didn't think I needed a phone. I just grabbed the bag, water, and hot bar. Right, right. Water, food, bag. Okay. So anyways, we, we so the first thing was you couldn't call 911. Well, her phone was in the car, wasn't it? Yes. Okay, so you could have turned her phone back on and called 911, right? I don't know her code. Well, I don't okay. Know her past good, anything. good point. Good point. That's another you odd code fact. For 911. Well, maybe he doesn't know that. Did you know you didn't need a code for 911? No, I didn't okay. try using that. That's code. completely reasonable. I believe you. I didn't even try to use her phone. I just okay. I don't want Why did you turn it off in the first place? Because I didn't know what to do with it. But that doesn't make any sense. How does that help you? So, because we know, right, from the facts that you turned that phone off some point in time in the uh, the, the computer trip. I, I'm just going to call them a computer trip. We got the computer trip, we got the gas trip, and then we got the disposal of the body trip. So, sometime in the computer trip, you turned her, her phone off. Why? I don't know. I just didn't need it. I turned it off because I didn't need her phone. Right, but she you didn't know she had fallen yet because she hadn't fallen at that point in time, had she? I have no idea. I wasn't there. Well, yes, you did know because the computer trap... Extended interrogations, especially those involving complex cases, can lead to emotional exhaustion for both the detectives and suspects. This exhaustion may manifest as frustration, and that's what's happening here. Stephen may sense the detective's frustration as a form of challenge or confrontation. In response, he's become more defensive and less cooperative, leading to even more senseless answers as a way to protect himself. Okay, are, there, are you stopped for an hour? Are you stopped for 45 minutes? Are you stopped when you go down the dusty road? I don't know how long. I, I, I don't care. Oh, I won't leave that. No, what, no, what I'm saying to you is, I'm not asking if you to give me times, okay. okay? I'm asking for you to tell me what you were doing. We know the time. Okay. The time is set in stone. It's two hours and something. Okay. All right. And so for two hours and something, you are in or around her car with her at a minimum unconscious or lifeless body. Correct? Yes. Okay. What are you doing? 
I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. I don't know what to do. These all are the big things. thing in my head is this all, it's no. a terrible situation for me. Now. Here, let, let's, let me, let me, let's role play. Okay. Uh, Mr. McAdol, I pulled down the dusty road and I sat there. It could have been hours. And I just thought, what the hell am I going to do? What the hell am I going to do? Or Mr. McAdol, I drove around for a long time. Yeah, we know it couldn't be that because you'd run out of gas. Um, or Mr. Backadol, I parked on that dirt road and I walked up and down, up and down the road, pacing, because I've got this situation that I can't explain can't. going on in the back of my right. What are you doing? What are you doing for two hours? Now, a suspicious person would say, you're disposing of a human body. But I don't know how to do that. I don't know anything about disposing of a body. You can't dig a hole? No, with my bare hands? Okay, well, you, well, you don't need to use your bare hand. You use a shovel. I don't have a shovel. Okay, all right. But anyways, I'm saying it's a suspicious mind. I'm not saying that's me. I don't have any tools. I don't have. I want you to tell me what were you doing. I gave you some scenario. I said you could be digging a hole and put a body in it. You could be pacing. You could be sitting in the car thinking, what the hell am I going to do? What were you doing? I had pulled over and I sat. And okay. I thought. And I didn't know what to do because, yes, I'm afraid. I am panicked. All I'm thinking about is everything I know is done. My life that I worked hard to get to. Uh, but you haven't done anything. You didn't do anything. It's not how I can't say that. It doesn't look like that. It's it's always going to be a matter of how does it look. How does it look now? It always, it looked bad from the get-go. It looked bad. It doesn't look, if you had called the cops, the moment you came in on Trisha laying on the floor, called 911 and got an ambulance there, do you think that would look worse than where we are today? Yes, because depending on what she had done, Assuming it was her setting me up again, then now it's just her telling them that I did something. Her telling them that I hit her. Her telling them that I pushed her. Her telling them that I did anything in any way to her, and I can't vouch that I didn't. And so you don't say that that's not what happened. And so instead of manning up, manning up and dealing with that, you threw her unconscious, most probable lifeless body in the backseat of her car, drove her out into the wilderness. The mother of your child and disposed of her body. That's how you ended up handling it, right? I didn't know what I was doing in the first place. I just didn't know what to do. If you're so confused and so out of it in terms of not knowing what to do, is it possible you don't really know what happened between you and her? Is it possible something else happened? Is it possible she pushed your buttons? Definitely not. She was very cordial the whole time. She was nice. Every time we're in person, she tends to be what we call normal. Okay, so you're sitting down this road, which which I know you now, Jesse's, and they, they really want the body. No big, I, hey, don't eat it. But now this road where you have no idea where it is, what road it's off of or where it is, and you're sitting in this car for a long time, long time, and you do what? What do you decide to do? I took her out of the car. Yeah? And I laid her down. She breathing? Not that I can tell. Okay, so she's dead. She's dead. I don't know why we had to go through to get to this point. You said it to Jess already earlier, but she, she's dead now, right? When you take her out of the car and you lay her on this dirt road, this um, dark, desolate dirt road, you lay the mother of your child, she's dead, right? As far as I can tell, she's not alive, but I don't know that. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not a doctor. I don't know. I just know. I just don't want right. to get part of you this. Didn't, you didn't like see if she had a pulse. You didn't. Touch her skin to see if she was cold. To the pupils. I just seemed like something to do, just see if they responded. And they were like half rolled back and then I freaked even more. And I just. Right, was she cold? Was she cold to the touch? No, I don't remember being cold. I just. Okay. I just looked at the eyelid to, to see if I could see, like, if it would, if it would, what do you call it? Dilate, I think it's a term. And it didn't. No, and, and then when I saw her eyes was like half rolled back, I didn't. I freaked even more because it's not dilating, it's half rolled back. I don't know what her chest do. wasn't heaving, she wasn't coughing, she wasn't sputtering, there was no, no I, as far I, as I could tell, she was she Say wasn't. it. Say it. As far as I could tell, she was not alive. But I don't No 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 no, I don't like that word. I don't like not alive. Because that's kind of squishy. I like the word dead. She as far as you could tell, those she was words. dead, right? Then those are your words. Well, can you you can't say dead? No. I'm not saying she was dead. I don't know that. Can you say as far as you could tell she was dead? No. Okay. But you could say, as far as you could tell, she was not alive. She was unresponsive, definitely unconscious. 
And I hoped beyond all right. hope that I was wrong about the situation. And so you 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 pulled her out and you just laid her right there on the road. I laid her down and I crossed her arms. On the middle of this dirt road, right? Some yes, not in the middle of the road. Okay. Off to the side. Okay. Did you leave the kachi bars in the water with her? No. You didn't? No. Why? Because I just wasn't sure of anything at that point. I just didn't think to leave them at that point. I just Because you knew she was dead. I didn't know that. You brought the water in the kachi bars in case she woke up. That's what you told me originally. In case she came to. Yes. yes. But now when you're dumping her on the side of the road, on this dark, desolate road, dirt road, you don't leave the water in the kachi bars because you know she's not unconscious. She's dead. Hoping that the case. Even though it may look small, our genius cop has successfully reached a major breakthrough. Stephen has accepted that he was essentially disposing Trisha's dead or not alive body. This development not only establishes Stephen's direct connection to the crime scene, but also suggests a level of culpability in the aftermath of Trisha's death. From a legal and investigative standpoint, this information is vital in constructing a case against Stephen. Intentionally moving, hiding, or improperly handling a deceased person's body can lead to charges of abuse of a corpse. This offense is typically a misdemeanor, but can escalate to a felony depending on the severity of the actions. Plus, concealing or altering evidence, including a body, may lead to charges of tampering with evidence. Worse. Worse. And you made it better or worse by not taking them to where the body is so they can confirm or repeat your story. Make it better or worse for you? It's only Hold on. because I can't okay. tell you where that is. Okay. Okay. I don't know where that is. And I know you feel like I should, and I should know this, but I don't. I don't okay. know. All right. And and you make it better or worse by throwing away the clothes you're wearing during this entire episode. Is it better or worse? Worse. Okay. And so there's no question that the guy we see on the video, what were you wearing? You have the backpack? Dark backpack, right? It's an old it didn't look like a kid's high school backpack. It looked different. It's an old military bag. I had it for many trips. So it's like one of those big ass, what do they call them in the military? It's just a bag. I don't know. It's a backpack I've used for many different deployments and, and trips I've gone on. It's right. just a big bag. I use it to pack clothes. And Kept it all these years. Yeah, it was old, but I still had it, yes. And threw it away the day your ex wife was missing. But, right? Well, because of all the junk that was in it, yes. Right. Water, water, water bottle with coffee yeah. bars in there, too? Yes. Okay. Um, when and where did you change out of the... Did, did, did all of this transpire in the two hours? Uh, I mean, I just don't want, I'm just so want to hear another story later or some other day. Is there anything? This is your opportunity to tell us anything that you think is important that we haven't asked you. Is there anything you can pick up? I, you got to speak up because we're trying to get this recorded. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Jeez. Out and about with your wife's ex wife's body in the backseat of her car. No, she's asleep. And how old was she at the time? She slipped too. Okay. And this is this is the same job you were criticizing Trisha for for letting her play in the waves. And you left her home alone. She was asleep. What would happen if she woke up? I don't know. Didn't care. Not that I didn't care, of course I care about my daughter. Okay. So just so we're clear for the record, you this is this is it. It's a laptop, gas trip, third trip, out to the dead end road, right? The detective's use of the better or worse framing is a technique aimed at getting Stephen to reflect on the consequences of his actions. By presenting contrasting scenarios, the detective is attempting to prompt Stephen to choose the correct answer. You might have noticed how Stephen then rests his head on the table. It might be an expression of fatigue, frustration, or emotional distress. It can also suggest a moment of introspection as he grapples with the implications of the detective's questioning. You killed her mother. You killed her mother. You killed her mother. You killed her mother. I would never do that to her. I would not kill her. 
The dynamic shift between the good cop and the genius cop, especially with the good cop leaving the room after making a straightforward accusation, followed by the return of the genius cop, could be a deliberate strategy to create a contrasting atmosphere. The genius cop may employ a unique approach to elicit information or a confession by emphasizing empathy or alternative perspectives. This unconventional method aims to unsettle the suspect and prompt a response that might differ from typical interrogation tactics. The rotation of these approaches increases the likelihood of revealing critical information. But now, the genius cop is about to do something extraordinary. I've seen everything that we have. I've seen all the interviews. And at this point, I know we've come in and we talk to you over and over and over again. We've talked to you in Rolling. We've talked to you here. And we've always talked about the past. What happened that night? What happened that night? What happened that night? So what I want to do is I want to kind of talk to you about the future or going from here. Okay. Now, I'm, you, you've already heard about all the stuff that we got. I mean, there's no question about what happened that night. We know that it's more than you're telling us. We know that you were involved with, with her death. We know that. Okay. So the question is not what happened or anything like that. What we need to understand is going forward. Okay. There's going to be a trial. Okay, there's going to be uh, press. There's going to be everybody looking at this. You've seen how these things, they get huge. The media gets involved and everybody's going to have an opinion about what happened. And everybody's going to have an opinion about you and your relationship and what kind of person you are. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the thing that, that we're trying to do here is, I, I mean, I talked to you earlier. You're a nice guy. I like you. I mean, I think we could be friends, you know, in different circumstances. But here's the thing, you know, there's going to be two narratives going forward okay and what i want to do is try to give you the opportunity to kind of tell me more about what narrative actually happened okay so what, what we're looking at is you know there, there's the one option okay and that's the option that you were kind of getting from earlier when, when tom was in here which is you know you planned this you came down here with the intent purpose to, to hurt trisha that you were going to that you planned to ditch your car here in some calculated way and you plan to go put her in a certain place that she, nobody could find her and all that kind of stuff. And and that sounds pretty bad, right? I mean, yeah, that's, I mean, you wouldn't agree with that. Okay. Yeah. Now, the, the other alternative is that, and like I said, we, we know what happened. We know that, you know, that something beyond what you were telling us happened in the house. But I think the more likely story is having seen, I mean, trust me, I've been here, you haven't seen me before involved in this, but I've seen you, okay? I've done a lot of research in your background and I know what it was like with Trisha. I know what kind of stuff you went through. I know she had a wild streak when she was younger. I know what she did and she came after you, you know, in that, that domestic thing that happened before. I know how that started, okay? I've, we've seen the reports, we know it all happened. You know, she went back and said, no, the whole thing was made up because she started, okay? What I think, is more to me having known you having known the background of everything between you and her everybody's gonna have their own opinion but I, I can see that i think probably what happened was something more like she started something that night okay and uh, you know having known what her background was having known how she treats you okay i've seen text messages i've seen how what she says to you okay i know what kind of stuff she she told you about stuff i get that i see that okay so i can see how that would kind of go that direction that night all right so what i want to do is try to try to set the set the stage so that you can actually tell the narrative about what actually happened which is not that you planned all this okay not that you planned down here kid to come down here and kill her and send her out in the woods like some sort of mass murderer I mean, really? I mean, like, like you're going to chop her up into little bits or something like that? I mean, 
That, that seems kind of ridiculous. Okay, that seems far fetched, like you said. Okay, and I don't think you plan all this. I don't think you're capable of that. Okay, I think what happens is sometimes things just get out of hand. Okay, you agree with that? Sometimes you know people start doing something and and they cause something to happen. Okay, and I'm not saying you wanted this to happen. All right, but I know you were there when it happened. Okay. What we want to understand is what actually happened that night, okay? And I know you were there. And I know, I don't believe it was your fault, okay? So what I imagine something to be, you know, is maybe you guys got in an argument. Maybe it was over the computer. Maybe it was over the gas. Maybe it was over whatever, okay? Any little nitpicky thing that she's going to get on you about, which she always did. I get that, okay? And things got heated. Okay, you're down here to try to see your daughter. Okay, you're a good dad. You're trying to be down here to spend time with with somebody that you care about, your daughter. And Trish is here again, you know. And unfortunately, I'm sure that doesn't make you feel that good. She's spending, she's trying to spend time with your daughter. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. But but it's you know. And Trisha came over, but then things started getting kind of ugly. Okay, and I'm sure she started there. And you didn't want to get involved in that. Okay, but. If she starts pushing things, she's not going to back up. She, she's she's unrelenting. Okay, I've seen this. Okay, I've seen the history. I've seen the background of how this works. Okay, so what what I could see happening is that maybe she came at you, and I mean, just defending yourself. She falls. Maybe. Um, you, you didn't realize how hard you pushed her out of the way, but you're just trying to defend yourself. You see what I'm saying? I'm not saying that you tried to hurt her, but I'm saying that it's clear that something happened there and that resulted in Trisha getting injured to the point where she, where she was deceased. Okay. And then beyond that, I can see you know, putting myself in your shoes for a minute. Okay. I see that you're, you're a hard worker. Okay, you've you've rose to the ranks. You're in the Air Force. You've been there what 11, 12 years? You said. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a long time. That's a career. You've devoted your life to to that career, to this country. Okay, you've got your daughter to think about. Okay, something happened. It's Trisha's own fault. Now she's gone. I mean, there's nothing you can do about that. People aren't going to believe that that you weren't you know planning to do this. People aren't going to believe that you weren't intending to hurt her in some way. But sometimes shit just happens. And now here it is. So now you've got to make a choice. Okay. Do you call the cops and roll the dice that we're going to believe your story? Or do you try to do the, you, you go into a little bit of panic mode. And trust me, if I was in the same, I don't know what I would have done. Okay. I couldn't even imagine being in that position. But I can understand going into that a panic mode of, holy shit, what do I need to do now? And so... Your first plan, I mean, you told us that your plan was that you were just going to take her back to the house and you were going to leave her there, which I understand because she's going to be back by your house and people are going to find her. And, you know, then maybe, maybe they'll, maybe they'll look other where, other places. You know what I mean? And, and I understand that. Okay. And that's what you told us. That was, that was kind of your first thought, but that's probably when you saw that Joshua was still home. So, and, and. Now you're not going to run the risk of him coming out when when this is all going on because I mean that's that's not going to work well for you at all, right? I mean if Joshua comes out and sees all this, he's not going to understand. He's obviously going to think that you planned this and did this intentionally. So so now we're going to go back to the house, okay? And of course, Trisha, being the way she is, there's no gas in the car. Typical Trisha, and I keep. I mean, come on. I mean, how how much how hard is it to go fill up a gas tank? I mean, really, it's not that hard. It's not that hard. You got to think ahead about this type of stuff. I never look at gas, my gas tank go below a quarter of a tank. That's me, you know, but I pay attention to that stuff. My wife, she'll run my gas tank all the time. And the next thing you know, I got to go out in the middle of the night because I got to run and get groceries or something. I'm also getting gas because she didn't think ahead about it. Okay. So, so now, well, obviously, you can't go to the gas tank, the gas station in her car because... She's in the car. Well, that's, that's not going to look good, right? So you head back to the house, and you do the only thing you can think of is, is hopefully somebody has some gas there, right? And we, we confirm that. We talk to everybody. 
And yeah, yeah, you did. You tried to get some gas in the house. And then you decided that you just have to go get gas. But then are you going to take your own car? Obviously, because you don't want to get her car. So, I mean, that's all confirmed. And that, and that makes perfect sense. Okay. So, and then now you're going to have to go to plan B, which is unfortunately you're going to have to take her somewhere else because you can't risk somebody seeing you with, with her in the car, right? Because that's going to be too hard to explain. And it is. And now we're in this position. It's very difficult to explain. And I get that. But what we need to do is, is moving forward. I mean, it's, it's and like I said, it's, it's, it's these two narratives, okay? We need to understand now what happened because we, we're going to write reports about this. So this is all on video. This is all going to go forward into this file. This is inevitable. I can't change this at this point. This is a roll, this is a boulder rolling down the hill, okay? The only thing I can do is alter the course slightly. And the only thing that I can do at this point, and like I said, I think you're a good guy. I've talked to you. You're a nice guy. Okay. I don't think that you were a cold-blooded killer who came down here with the explicit intention to murder her. Okay. I don't think that's the case. Okay. But right now, I I can't say otherwise. I can't say that there was accident because you're not telling us something other than that. Okay. We have all this evidence, and then we also have. Things are not consistent, okay? We're having inconsistencies where there's still, even after all of this, there's still holes in the story that we can prove through evidence that what you're telling us is not completely true. And that continues to make it look like even having understanding that this, this happened and it was out of your control and we know what happened, you're still trying to tell us little lies about what happened so that it makes you look better. And unfortunately, that's, that's not going to help you because any lie at this point is going to make you look bad. And it's going to tip that hold right back to everybody think, oh, well, he's a liar. He's a cold-blooded murderer. He came down here to kill her. And they're going to put you on, you know, like these poachers with all these, you know, serial killers and stuff like that. That's not where you need to be, okay? Sometimes people just make mistakes. Sometimes accidents happen. Sometimes things get out of control. And that's understandable, but you have to tell us that story. We have to understand what happened so that we can tell that story. Because once I, once we're done here, we don't make any more recordings. We don't write more reports. Once I put in my report, whatever happened, that's that's set in the cell because that's what you told me. Whatever your words are, that's what we can. That's what we take to court. That's going forward. What you told us about what happened. That's what you told us. Uh, the truth was, okay? And if we come back and show that, hey, that's not the actual truth, then again, that just looks horrible for you. And that starts to tell that other narrative. All right? So I think that you were there when she was injured and that she was injured in some way that was not a direct attack from you. But I think that you have more information about what actually happened to her. Because I know you were in the house with her when it happened. Is that true? No. Okay. No. Listen, we, I know, and you tell me that, okay? And you're using very specific language. So tell me, I'm not saying that you lay a hand on her, but I know that you were there when she was injured. So you need to explain to us how it was she, she became injured because, because this whole thing where you came back from the gas station and you just got her like that, I know that's not true. I, and I can prove that's not true. Okay? And I don't want that for you. I don't want you to be locked into the story where you're telling us a lie about how she became injured. Because if you lie about how she became injured to me right now, then that makes it look like you did it on purpose. Of course not. And, well, and that's not the story that I want to tell. Okay? And I want you to be able to tell the story about what actually happened and for the truth to get out there. The only thing that's going to help you at this point is the truth. And and I know that the truth is not that you came home and you found her after you went to the gas for her. No, that's not the truth. Okay? And I need you to tell us the truth so that I can tell the actual truth when we go to court. Because that's what I'm here for. I'm here to find out the truth about what happened. I'm not I'm not here to try you. I'm not a jury. I'm not a judge. I'm not a lawyer. Okay? I'm a detective. A detective's my sole job is to find the truth about what happened. Because once I'm done with my job, I can write the truth in my report, and I can be satisfied that I understand the entire truth. But if there's something that doesn't add up, 
if there's something that I know to be a lie, I have to keep hitting at it, and I keep hitting at it, and I keep hitting at it, and I have to bring that up in court because they're going to ask me, is this the whole truth? Is this what actually happened? And I'm going to have to say, I have evidence contrary to that. I know that that's not what happened, and I know he's lying. Okay? But the only person who is in that house who can tell us what happened to Patricia is you. But if you don't tell us the truth about what happened, it just continues to make it look like you're lying to us to cover up something more sinister, for lack of a better word. Like, you intended this to happen, and now you're covering up. And I don't want that to be the story. It's not the story. And I know. And that's why I want you to have this opportunity to tell me the the truth about how she became injured, how the, how Trisha lost her life. Yet you, you, you do. You do. You do. Okay? And I know that you were in the house. Like I said, I can, I can prove the extended monologue by Detective Oliver serves a unique purpose. Such lengthy narratives are generally used to create an atmosphere of understanding, making the suspect more receptive to sharing information. It's a strategic attempt to keep Stephen engaged, lower his guard, and foster a sense of psychological intimacy. And I appreciate that. Because even then I say, oh yeah, she attacked me. You come back in here like, okay, so you attacked her. Like, no, that's not what I said. So then you're just going to have me go down this rabbit hole of different stories now. I don't want that either. I don't, like I told you, okay? I, I can prove, I can prove one thing, okay? I can prove that you were at the house with Trisha when she was injured. I can prove that. So the question lies with you as to, you're the only one who was there with her. Like I said, you're the only person who can tell us what happened. So this is your opportunity to tell us what happened in the house before you left. Because that's when I know she was injured. And I can prove that. What I need to know is what happened in the house. Because I know what you're telling me is a lie, and I can prove that. But if you stick with that story and I can prove that it's a lie, everyone's going to assume the worst. Then they assume the worst. So if, I, if I sit here and say, yeah, we argued, she attacked me, then they're just going to assume, okay, you being the bigger, stronger person, you hit her, or you did something to her, or you you in some way hurt her, and that... I never, ever would do I'm, that. I'm not asking you. I'm not, not asking you to make up some murder bag. I didn't come down here with some dubious plan. See, I didn't. Exactly. I'm not that kind of person. And that's and that's what I'm saying is that you're not that type of person. But by continuing to lie to us about what happened and when it happened, you're opening that door for everyone to assume it, and you know everyone's going to assume it. They already. I know. They I don't assume that. Before. If I thought that was the case, I wouldn't be in here talking to you right now. Because if I thought you had this murder bag and you came down here with the express intent to kill Trisha, no, I'd be like, you know what? Never. There's no sense in talking to this guy. He's a psychopath. No. And he's and he's not even he's not worth anybody's time. That's why you're divorced. But I'm not gonna murder the woman. But I'm not gonna That's that's why I want to come in here and talk to you and try to give you the opportunity to set the record straight and tell us the truth about what happened with Trisha. Because I know what you're telling us right now is a lie. And I don't want you to be stuck in this lie. Because once I write it in my report, it's done. This is what Stephen told us, and that's it. But I can prove that's not true. That's not how I want to end this report. Because everybody wants to know what happened to Trisha. If Trisha had an accident, if Trisha came at me when she fell. The detective is trying to encourage Stephen to keep sharing information by saying that every time he tells his story, it gets closer to the truth. This positive feedback is meant to make Stephen feel more comfortable talking and sharing details. Stephen's defense walls will get lowered subconsciously as this psychological technique is designed to make the suspect feel that cooperation and honesty will be met with reward and gratification. Pushing your buttons up against the wall with this key thing and she gets you in trouble. Then next thing I know, I saw that she was she's talking to your, your commanding officer's wife or something about you being with this girlfriend. I saw all this stuff. She's always pushing your buttons. She's always all I'm just trying to do is and like, you are trying to do the right thing. Trying to be a good okay? person. And then here it is. You're trying to be a good person. And it's still not working. And she I comes in work. it is a stressful I thing never to have to deal with, deal with the kid. And in the middle of the night, who wants the mommy and they will not take no for an answer. She would have that's stressful. And I, I just felt like that would, would pull by to deny you your mother. That would push anybody's buttons. That would put anybody on edge. I talked to her, I've been there. Sometimes my kids start screaming, I don't want my mommy, I don't want my mommy. And, and it's like upset with my daughter. I don't, I just said, I don't get upset I don't get upset. And honestly, honestly, it, it makes me feel a little upset. 
and myself because why am I not good enough for my, well, my own daughter? You know? I'm not man enough, and I know that. I wish I could be there more, but I, I can't. It's just the circumstances, I, I can't change that, you know, how often I can be there. So I just do what I can. But no, I'm not upset that she wants her money. No, That's and, fine. And I get that. And I get that. And so you try to be the, again, you're trying to be the nice guy. You're trying to do the right thing for for your daughter now. She wants her mommy. You know what? You don't really like Trisha. You don't want to see her in the middle of the night. You don't want her to come back over. But you know what? You will make that sacrifice for your daughter. Of course I would. And then when she shows up, she's probably got an attitude. What what I mean, what's her deal? I don't ever know what her deal is. She always has her own agendas. I don't I just try to ignore them. I just I just pretend that whatever she says is just take it as a grain of salt and move on. And and I know she's got to feed into it. I don't I don't ask questions. I don't answer anything. I just I just smile and nod kind of thing. But I sometimes just, she won't she won't take that. Well, no, that's just her personality. And she's going to keep pushing because she's got she's got to end the conversation. And she's got to get to better. some resolution. And I love her. And she's going to keep prodding and poking about whatever the stupid thing is that she's upset about. Okay, and I get that. Okay, we, we all understand that. We've all been there. Okay, so and, and I understand how this the, the, the kind of the atmosphere of that night. I, I can't I can't blame you. Okay, for panicking after all of this. Okay, but you got but Stephen Stephen. But I, but I want to tell you right now. Okay, you need some guidance. Sometimes you weren't sure what to do. I can tell you right now. The right thing to do is to tell us what actually happened. It is. It's gonna. It's. It's going to help you enormously. It's. It's. I, I know you think that the truth is gonna is gonna make it look so much worse. Okay, but it, I can tell you right now, the truth is never anywhere near as bad. As what people will believe if you let them come up with their own story. I don't believe I hate her. I never hate her. I didn't. So hate tell her. me. Hate so tell me that story. Tell me what happened. Tell me what happened so that I can I can tell them. And but it was and you tried and I know you did. Even after she was off with this other dude, you you brought the family back together. You had a child with her to try to create this happy family. That's Even awesome. though you didn't that really want to, but you, you did. You tried so hard. Okay, and I get that. And I get that. And I appreciate that. I think you're a good guy. You're a family man. You're trying. You're trying to do the best that you can. Okay? You got a, you got a career. Okay? You provide. You're a good guy. I mean, especially, you know, there's a lot of people that, that you know, they don't even, they don't even try. They have had their kids. They, they don't get a job. They're up drinking, drinking, doing drugs, all kinds of shit. But you're you're not that guy. Be the right, just do the right thing and be a good person and try to be a good father from a distance, I guess. And you did, and you were doing a good job, okay? But sometimes people throw monkey wrenches into your plans, okay? And you're trying to do the best that you can. You're trying, and I can see that. And I, like I said, I've seen all your guys' communication, all your text messages, and how you talk to each other, and. She was she was trying you. I mean, she would. I mean, you wanted to talk to your daughter. You wanted to be there for you because you don't want to just abandon. Here's yet another monologue by Detective Oliver. By subtly blaming Trisha in the monologue, the detective might be trying to align with Stephen's perspective and emotions. Stephen's occasional contributions indicate his level of disagreement with the narrative presented by the detective. But the very fact that he's talking is a sign that blaming Trisha is working for him. We're there. We're there. <laughs> Okay, you're you're here with us, not be, because of what happened, and we need to understand the truth about what happened. Because I know you're scared. I know you're scared about what's going to happen in the future. But before you were panicking because you didn't want anybody to know you were involved. You didn't want anybody to know you were there. You wanted it to go away. That that is a normal human response. That's what anybody would do in that situation. That you're panicking. You're panicking. That's that's a that's a it's a reasonable that's a reasonable thought process that people can understand. But what we can't get past is you continuing to, to lie about what happened. And I can't let you continue to lie about what happened. I need you to tell me the truth about what happened. I know you were there. I want to give you the opportunity to tell me what happened. Yeah. <laughs> 
I know you did. You, you've got you've got to clear this off. I can see that this is this is not something you can carry around. It's 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 not something that's gonna, you can weigh weigh you down for the rest of your life. I've so many times to just say the truth or talk to a counselor, and I don't even know what to tell them. I don't even know how to tell them. I don't know, and and it's impossible for somebody who's outside to understand sometimes. But you you got to let us know the truth about what happened, so that you can move past this for yourself. You got you got to wait, get this weight off of your shoulders. Because it's going to destroy you, and you can't you can't let that happen to yourself. You, you've, regardless of what happens from here, you still have a daughter. You are still a father. You still have somebody you're responsible for. Okay, and you can't. You, in, in one way, I can't. I, no, that's not true. It's and, and 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 don't think that's the truth. Okay, I can't guarantee you what's going to happen. Okay, I, it's not up to me. But what I can do is I can tell you. That we need to know the truth about what happened. That everyone, the families, they need to know what happened. Because you cannot let everyone else make it. The detective is expressing empathy and reassurance to Stephen, acknowledging his fear about potential consequences and emphasizing that they are here to understand the truth. This approach aims to create a supportive atmosphere, encouraging Stephen to share more details about the situation. The detective is attempting to alleviate Stephen's concerns about the future and build trust, emphasizing the importance of uncovering the truth rather than focusing solely on the legal consequences. And of course, it works. I'm not going to deny you that, you know? <laughs> Just come by. That's fine. And then, no, I never liked her around. I never liked being in a one on one situation with her because I could never predict her. I don't know what version of her I'm getting at that moment. And so, no, I never liked being in a one on one situation. Just right. because. Just like now, it's only, only in my word or her word or whatever. <laughs> Can't change how things freaking look. Right. So, yeah, she came over talking about nonsense and bringing up child support and just more stupid stuff. And I just, for the most part, tried to ignore. And then, yeah, there was a mix up with the check, but that's not my fault because you told me this was your address. So, yeah, that's where I mailed it to. And then she's telling me that's not the mailing address. And she's talking about my mom. And I'm like, that's not my fault. If you told me you moved, I did the responsible thing and I made sure the check was going to go wherever you moved to if you're not in your mom's house. And then she's just going on and on and on. Now I owe her more money and back child support. And, just, and I'm just sitting here like, then I'll fix it. I'll send you another. I'll do something, but I don't have the money now. So just. Give me some time, like, because that money that you didn't get it on time is already spent. I spent it to come here, and now I need a little more time to get it to you. And now she's talking about how she's going to go to court and all this other stuff, but it's my fault. And I'm just like, this isn't even my fault. Like, you told me you moved, so I adjusted it. Like, just calm down. Like, this isn't even that serious. This is an easily rectifiable why are you getting all on hand about this, you know? Right. And, and, and yeah, I know I need to go through the court to pay child support, but every time I tried, it was just, she just stonewalled me. It's like, I don't want to do that because I have to pay money to send you money, which is stupid. I was like, just let me have your account information. Just, just the account number, and I'll direct deposit it, and this will never happen. And no, that was, that's not going to work. And you can't do that. You owe me all this money. And then she's going to go to court and make me pay all the other money from the divorce that I already took over ten thousand like twenty some thousand dollars in debt that I have to pay back in eighteen months. And if I don't pay all that back, I got another six thousand dollars I gotta pay as far as back child support. So now she's trying to say I'm gonna have to pay all that back. And then she just gets on my face about it. And I'm like, what? Why are you so mad right now? Like is it because I called you this late? It just it just completely got out of hand. And then there's the whole pointing and the, the I just it just all went bad it just so fast she just went from zero to 100 and i'm trying to understand like what just happened like you were just here earlier everything was fine you left we're arguing about something that i'm sitting here thinking this is unbelievably trivial and this can be fixed i can fix this by the first just give me time and i'll make sure you get the money or i'll make it in two separate payments or whatever you need me to do and it's just not it's just not good. It's not going to work. None of this works. And she eventually falls asleep anyway, but she's still like arguing with me over in the, the, the foyer area. And I'm just like, 
please just leave it. Just go. No, I'm not leaving to fix it. It's like, just, just get out. Like, I don't, I don't know what you want from me, Trisha. I don't have any money for you. I don't have any cash for you. I can't give you anything right now. I spent the little money I had, which is why I drove here to fly. I didn't get a rental car like I normally do. I'm not in a hotel. Well, I don't want to do a hotel thing, but I don't have money. Like, mm-hmm. I just I paid so much money to the debt that I don't have any more money, okay? I just don't. I am, like, pretty much strapped when it comes to cash. Living paycheck to paycheck, and even then, I'm not making it right now. And it just, it just it doesn't matter. You owe me money. You need to pay your debts. This is always your fault. You're always spending more money, and it's just... On and on and on to the point where now I'm just trying to like walk away. Now I can't walk away because you're circling me and like you're jumping in front of my face and you just it, it just got so aggressive and I'm just trying to back away and de-escalate and I can't even leave the house now. You know I don't want to push you. I don't want to touch you. I don't want anything with you because all I'm having I'm just thinking about flashbacks of before when you just blew all this, this for no reason and then now I'm getting arrested. Sticking to the easier prompt laid by Detective Oliver, Stephen continues to cast himself as the nice guy while blaming Trisha. He's trying to shift the responsibility and garner sympathy. By highlighting issues like child support and portraying Trisha as aggressive, Stephen is trying to justify his actions, rationalize the crime, and mitigate his perceived role in the events. But only after the fact did you go and, you know, say that it wasn't my fault. No, no one else knows that now. But only after the fact that I got arrested. All I'm thinking just... And just flashbacks. I, move, I go to push her away, and then she gets really pissed about that. And then she gets even more aggressive and in my face and pushing me back. And I'm like, "Would you please just stop? Like, I don't want. I don't want this. I don't know what's going on. I don't know why you're so mad. I don't know if you, if you took a freaking crazy pill all the way over here and that really pissed her off. And uh, it just, it just escalated. And then I just moved her away, and then she slipped. And that's when she freaking fell. And I'm like. Oh, sh- I asked her if she was okay. It was like a weird sound. She didn't say anything, though. And then I freaking panicked. And then I, I just freaking panicked. Because I didn't read. I didn't try to hurt you. I just wanted you to stop being here in my face yelling at me as I'm trying to back away. I'm trying to de-escalate. I don't want... Whatever this is, it's not It's not that serious. I don't know why it's so serious about this money. It's always been so, like... Even throughout the divorce, every penny has just been so serious about her trying to get every dollar. Right. And I'm like, and now I made a mistake and I sent the check to the wrong address because I didn't know that wasn't a mailing address. And I, I can't explain where it is. And I didn't even get it back in the mail until a week after that. And it, it's just... All right. <laughs> I'm just trying and to that's... de-escalate the situation. You're like, couldn't get out. I didn't know where to go. I didn't even just leave. Like, all I wanted to do was just leave. I just wanted to do with that. Do you know what she hit her head on? Was it the floor or? I don't know. It just, she just fell. And then she just she wasn't responsive after that. And I didn't know what the hell to do. <laughs> you know, I thought I was going to call the police now. I was going to say I freaking pushed her. And I'm going to check. <laughs> <laughs> so so what were, what did you do next? And just try I like I just tried to wait for her, tried to like snap her out of it and just it just kept getting worse. Just she just wasn't responding. You know, she had she made weird breathing sounds and I'm thinking, oh sh what a tail. Like I want to kill you this woman that I never wanted to hurt. Never. I don't think you I never wanted her to be her. I, I never wished ill on her. I tried to always do right by her, no matter what the situation. I just tried to do the right thing. And all I'm thinking is, I'm going to jail for, for trying not to hurt you. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's, that's exactly why I wanted you to tell me. The truth. <laughs> I just wanted to, to stop. I just wanted it to go away. I just wanted to just go back. It is <laughs> okay. And 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 that I believe you. I believe everything that you just told me. Okay, Stephen. Doesn't make it matter. It does. It makes it makes a huge difference because that's that's what we need to do. We need to get to the truth about it. <laughs> now you know you know the next question I'm going to ask you. Okay. 
And I know you don't want to, but we need to know where Trisha is. I don't know. And I I really don't have a freaking clue where that was. I just, I just, I just panicked and I just drove. And I know, I I I went through a million and one scenarios in my head of what to do. And none of them were good. All of them just ended bad. Even with an unconventional technique, the detective Oliver gets what he's looking for, a confession. This confession is a result of several factors, such as the cumulative psychological pressure applied by the detectives, the emotional toll of maintaining a false narrative, the realization that the truth cannot be concealed any longer, and the internal deliberations. Stephen is more concerned about his life being over because he'll have to spend time in prison, but he doesn't seem concerned or even aware that Trisha has already lost her life. And I know that's you, why I would never come down. I know you do some craziness like that. And I know you didn't want to. I know you didn't want to take her from them. I know that wasn't no, your intention. I would never do that. And my but, mother needs her mother. So, but, but the thing is that all her friends at church, there's a whole community. Okay. I'd like to give you the opportunity now to write an apology and try to get that off of yourself. I have no idea what I would say. I, the, the truth. The truth, because the truth is what? That you didn't mean for this to happen, but it did. And that you're, are you sorry? Are you sorry, are you sorry that it happened? Of course well, I am. You are. Holy crap. I, I wish I could have found another way to de escalate it, but she just, she just wouldn't let it so, go. She just kept pushing that, just pushing the issue, pushing the issue about money. And, and I don't think I don't have any money anyway. Like, just wait till the first I'll fix it, you know? Just, just, I don't want, I don't know why it's such a big deal with that. I know. It just I know. didn't even make sense. And this is, and this is going to be a lot of weight. And this has had been a lot of weight. I mean, you've carried a lot of this for so long now, for weeks. And that's more than anybody can really take. And I can tell you that getting this off your chest and writing an apology to these people saying you were sorry that it happened this way, you did not mean for it to happen this way. And although it didn't happen, that you're truly sorry, I think that's going to help lift a lot of weight. Is that something that you'd like to do? I don't feel like sorry. It means anything it, to anybody. You'd be surprised. I don't feel sorry. You'd be surprised. People people want to know that. Of course, I'm freaking sorry. I do. Okay, I'll, I'll get you, I'm going to step out for a minute. I'll get you um, some paper, okay? And you can think about it if you want to do that real quick, okay? I'll be right back. Stephen's apparent lack of genuine remorse, despite expressing sorrow and shedding tears, is a superficial emotional response. Genuine remorse typically involves an acknowledgement of the impact on the victim and a sincere desire for redemption. In this context, Stephen's focus on his own emotions and the potential consequences for himself tells us what we need to know about his authenticity. He has what could be interpreted as a self-preservation mindset, prioritizing his own well-being over acknowledging the gravity of the harm inflicted on Trisha. However, even after this major breakthrough of a confession, Stephen has not revealed everything yet. The complete truth about how and why he killed Trisha comes out later. In October 2016, Stephen Williams appeared in front of Judge Lawrence Merman in Martin County, but everyone already knew that Trisha was not about to get the justice she deserved. A plea deal had been put in place. Stephen pleaded no contest to second-degree murder in exchange for leading investigators to her remains. Stephen's defense requested a mental evaluation because he was on self-harm watch in jail. The defense wanted to ensure he was okay for future proceedings. The evaluation report confirmed his competence. The judge sentenced Stephen to 35 years in prison for the second-degree murder of his ex-wife, Trisha Todd, and an additional five years for child neglect, to be served concurrently. Judge Meerman acknowledged that the sentence might not bring full justice, but without Stephen's plea, the family wouldn't have known the truth about Trisha's fate. Stephen's refusal to admit guilt, changing narratives, and dismissing certain details as irrelevant underlined a desire to control the narrative to protect his image. We can say that Stephen was aware of the consequences which led to fear of judgment and an attempt to control perceptions. While the good cop focused on challenging the inconsistencies, the genius cop employed empathetic strategies, understanding Stephen's tendency to blame others, especially the victim. 
The Genius Cop's monologues and efforts to find positives in Stephen's changing stories were rather unique but effective nonetheless. Overall, the interplay between the good cop's direct challenges and the genius cop's empathetic engagement created a dynamic that gradually broke down Stephen's defenses. Given the context, we invite you to share your thoughts and insights on this case. Do you think Trisha and her family received justice? What, according to you, could have been done to prevent this tragedy? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. If you'd like us to cover any case, please drop your suggestions. Also remember to like, comment, and subscribe so that we can keep covering such cases. Until next time, stay safe.